Hello everybody, this is Caitlin with the Twinsburg Library here for another awesome story and science. And today we're going to be running with one of my favorites, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs by Judy Barrett, and we're going to make some dancing, raining spaghetti. So it's going to be a little messy, but it's going to be a lot of fun. So you guys ready to get started? Let's do it. All right, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. We were all sitting around the big kitchen table. It was Saturday morning, pancake morning. Mom was squeezing oranges for juice. Henry and I were betting on how many pancakes we could eat. And Grandpa was doing the flipping. Seconds later, something flew through the air and headed towards the kitchen ceiling and landed right on Henry. After we realized that the flying object was only a pancake, we all laughed, even Grandpa. Breakfast continued quite uneventfully. All the other pancakes landed in the pan, and all of them were eaten, even the one that landed on Henry. Hey, that night, touched off by the pancake incident at breakfast, Grandpa told us the best tall tale bedtime story he'd ever told. Across an ocean, over lots of huge bumpy mountains, across three hot deserts, and one smaller ocean, there lay the tiny town of Chew and Swallow. In most ways, it was very much like any other tiny town. It had a main street lined with stores, houses with trees and gardens around them, a schoolhouse, about 300 people, and some assorted cats and dogs. But there were no food stores in the town of Chew and Swallow. They didn't need any. The sky supplied all the food they could possibly want. The only thing that was really different about Chew and Swallow was its weather. It came three times a day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everything that anyone ate came from the sky. Whatever the weather served, that was what they ate. But it never rained rain, it never snowed snow, and it never blew just wind. It rained things like soup and juice, it snowed mashed potatoes and green peas, and sometimes the wind blew in storms of hamburgers. The people could watch the weather report on television in the morning, and they would, they would even hear a prediction for the next day's food. When the townspeople went outside, they carried their plates, cups, glasses, forks, spoons, knives, and napkins with them. That way, they would always be prepared for any kind of weather. They, if there were leftovers, and there usually were, people took them home and put them in the refrigerators in case they got hungry in between meals. The menu varied. By the time they woke up in the morning, breakfast was coming down. After a brief shower of orange juice, low clouds of sunny-side-up eggs moved in, followed by pieces of toast. Butter and jelly sprinkled down for the toast. And most of the time, it rained milk afterwards. For lunch one day, frankfurters already in their rolls blew in from the northwest at about five miles an hour. There were mustard clouds nearby. Then the wind shifted to the east and brought in baked beans. A drizzle of soda finished off the meal. Dinner one night consisted of lamb chops, becoming heavy at times with occasional ketchup. Periods of peas and baked potatoes were followed by a gradual clearing with a wonderful jello setting in the west. The sanitation department of Chew and Swallow had a rather unusual job for sanitation department. It had to remove all the food that fell in the houses and sidewalks and lawns. The workers cleaned things up after every meal and fed all the dogs and cats. Then they emptied some of it into the surrounding oceans for the fish and turtles and whales to eat. The rest of the food was put back into the earth so that the soil would be richer for the people's flower gardens. Life for townspeople was delicious until the weather took a turn for the worse. Spaghetti ties up town! One day, there was nothing but gorgonzola cheese all day. The next day, there was only broccoli all overcooked. And the next day, there were Brussels sprouts and peanut butter with mayonnaise. Another day, there was a pea soup fog. No one could see where they were going, and they could barely find the rest of their meal that got stuck in the fog. The food was getting larger and larger, and so were the portions. The people were getting frightened. Violent storms blew up frequently. Awful things were happening. 
One Tuesday, there was a hurricane of bread and rolls all day long, and into the night. There were soft rolls and hard rolls, some with seeds and some without. There was white bread and rye and whole wheat toast. Most of it was larger than they had ever seen bread and rolls before. It was a terrible day. Everyone had to stay indoors. Roofs were damaged and sanitation department was beside itself. The mess took the workers four days to clean up, and the sea was full of floating rolls. To help out, the people piled up as much bread as they could in their backyard. The birds picked at it a bit, but it just stayed there and got staler and staler. There was a storm of pancakes one morning and a downpour of maple syrup that nearly flooded the town. A huge pancake covered the school. No one could get it off because of the weight, so they had to close the school. Lunch one day brought 15-inch drifts of ice, of cream, cheese, and jelly sandwiches. Everyone ate themselves sick, and the day ended with a stomach ache. There was an awful salt and pepper wind accompanied by an even worse tomato tornado. People were sneezing themselves silly and running to avoid the tomatoes. The town was a mess. There were seeds and pulp everywhere. The sanitation department gave up. The job was too big. Everyone feared for their lives. They couldn't go outside most of the time. Many houses had been badly damaged by giant meatballs. Stores were boarded up and there were no more school for the children. So the decision was made to abandon the town of Chew and Swallow. It was a matter of survival. People glued together the giant pieces of stale bread sandwich style with peanut butter took the absolute necessities with them and set sail on their rafts for a new land. After being afloat for a week, they finally reached a small coastal town which welcomed them. The bread held, held up surprisingly well, well enough for them to build temporary houses for themselves out of it. The children began school again, and the adults all tried to find places for the, some, themselves in the new land. The biggest change they had to make was getting used to buying food at the supermarket. They found it odd that the food was kept on shelves and packaged in boxes and cans and bottles. Meat that had to be cooked was kept in large refrigerators. Nothing came down from the sky except rain and snow. The clouds above their heads were not made of fried eggs. No one ever got hit by a hamburger again. And nobody dared go back to Chew and Swallow to find out what happened to it. They were too afraid. Henry and I were awake until the very end of Grandpa's story. I remember his goodnight kiss. The next morning, we woke up to see snow falling outside our window. We ran downstairs for breakfast and ate a little faster than usual so we could go out sledding with Grandpa. It's funny, but even as we were sliding around the hill, we thought we saw a giant pat of butter at the top, and we could almost smell the mashed potatoes. The end. Uh, I love that story. I love the giant food, and I like food acting a little differently than it normally does, and that's why we are going to have some dancing spaghetti. I got to grab some more spaghetti. So all you need for this experiment is... A glass of water, vinegar, baking soda, and some spaghetti. So what we're going to do is I have my glass filled about halfway with water, and then we're going to fill the other half with vinegar. All right. And then, just because I really like it, I'm going to add a little bit of food coloring. Just one drop. Just to add a little bit of more fun. Makes us be able to see the noodles a little bit better, like so. And then we're going to take some pre-cooked spaghetti and you're going to chop it into little tiny pieces, not tiny pieces, but pieces that are about an inch long. And you can put in as many or as little as you want. And you can use other pasta too. You can use spaghetti or vermicelli or whoop, other things. You can even use a raisin or muff balls or other random light things that you have. You want, don't want anything too heavy. That's why spaghetti works really well, but raisins work too. You can make dancing raisins. So I'm going to add just a few more, some smaller, some bigger. You can kind of experiment with the size of your noodles. And then comes the fun part. I'm going to add a little bit of baking soda. Now I'm going to add a little bit at a time. Miss Caitlin learned this the hard way. I had made a big mess earlier when I was planning this. So we're just going to add a little bit at a time. And you can see the baking soda is reacting with the vinegar and making carbon dioxide. I'm going to move it a little closer so you guys can see 
that their bubbles are starting to go all around the noodles. So I'm going to add a little bit more. We're going to see we need a lot of them. Oh my goodness. Oh, almost making a mess. Stay down, stay down. All right, once the bubbles go down a little bit, oh, look at that, we've got floating spaghetti. Now watch this, so we have some floating at the top. Now it's floating because all of the bubbles of carbon dioxide from the chemical reaction between the baking soda and the vinegar are using surface tension to hold on to the spaghetti. Now if we pop the bubbles a little bit, they'll go back down and they'll get more bubbles and then they'll float back up to the top. We're gonna pop some. And look at that, they're going down, and then going back up, and we have dancing, raining spaghetti, kind of like in our book. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye!